Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Ian Stewart. I'm going to be introducing the seminar series today. Thanks for joining us for our seminar series. Um, our next seminar is going to be on the 25th of May with uh, Dan Liu, so definitely tune back in for that one here in another uh, couple of months. Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing Jim Thorson, but before I introduce him, let's uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. First, you'll notice that we don't have any cameras set up for this meeting, so unfortunately we won't be able to see Jim giving his presentation, um, but I can assure you he really is there. Um, the presentation is going to be recorded and it'll be posted to the IPHC's website and YouTube channel after the after it gets processed. So if you missed it or you want to go back and check something, um, it will be available through those. As we go along, you can enter questions into the question box or into the chat box. I'm not sure which it is actually, but put them in either place and we will see them. Jim has let me know that he's going to divide the talk up into a few different sections, and we may have some time to pick up a few questions as we go along in between sections. So if you do have questions that pop up, go ahead and load them in as you go. And um, yeah, so I guess now by way of introduction, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Jim for the last 13 years now, um, and I confess that I think I'm only marginally qualified to introduce him. Jim has published almost 70 papers in the last four years. He's, his work has been consistently forward-looking. He's been focused on developing new methods for analyzing and understanding fisheries and ecological data with a particular focus on spatial processes. And I, personally, I routinely check in with Jim to see where our field is going to be heading in the near future because I think he's really breaking ground on a lot of these fronts. One of the most impressive aspects of Jim's work is the extent of his collaboration. I looked through the last 10 or 15 papers he's published, and he has an average of six co-authors. And so I think that really shows you the breadth uh, and broad interest in applying the advances in programming, statistical methods, and spatial analysis that Jim's been developing. Uh, he's also currently the program leader for, the, for habitat and ecological processes research at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And with that, uh, Take it over, Jim. Yeah, thanks so much, Ian. And, um, you know, thanks for hosting this talk. Um, I still remember us chatting on the phone when I was wrapping up my master's degree and kind of, you know, planning out what would it, what would become the PhD work. And, um, you know, it's super flattering to get to, you know, hear you say that and keep collaborating. So thank you. Um, Let's see. So, can you see my can you see my screen, or is it still frozen? Like, if I advance the next slide, you see it advance. Yeah, it looks great, Jim. Thanks. Okay. So, yeah, I'll be talking about um, three different uh, papers that collectively sort of discuss how to do a, a synthesis of movement and diet. So, basically, you know, I think, um, you know, it's a, been a dream of ecologists for you know centuries to sort of understand individual level, you know, movement and foraging decisions and how that's affected by prey availability. Um, you know, I'm I'm sort of hoping that some of these new tools are sort of easily digestible and sufficiently, um, you know, computationally performant that they will lead in the future, you know, in the near future to a synthesis of, of diet and movement ecology. So, um, you know, I, I'd say, you know, my background is to, that I started as a population dynamics and stock assessment fellow. And, um, you know, there's a set of methods related to age structured stock assessments that, um, you know, is a craft that takes years to develop, you know, and um, here's an example, you know, kind of cartoon of, of tracking age, you know, cohorts and very, very variable survival, you know, data weighting in the Eastern Bering Sea uh, survey. You know, given um, you know rapid climate impacts, there's a need to understand trophic ecology. You know, even among population dynamics and stock assessment folk, you know, if there's um, insufficient uh, forage and prey, you know, there's sort of claims of 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 die-offs of um, commercially important species, and so um, you know, in a in a changing ecosystem you know, suddenly a, a person might feel like they need to know population dynamics and trophic ecology. 
and then you know even from there there's these specialized methods for movement ecology you know here's a kind of schematic you know a simplified schematic <laughs> of a hidden markov model forward smoother um from a paper by um julie nielsen and you know she calls it convolution i don't know anybody who finds convolution the term convolution to be um in you know intuitive or welcoming <laughs> um and you know it, it but it is necessary you know there's these kind of new study you know new technologies and you know basically moore's law of tags that's allowing us to have a huge and in exponential increase in our tagging data um which is again going to be something that people need to be able to vet and track and feel confident about and so I think there's this world where suddenly, you know, we're called to un be experts in all three of these fields and, and others. So um, given that, I'm kind of hoping that we can come up with simplified methods. And this this first paper was published in Ecology, working with Yumi Aramitsu, Tal Levy, and Gretchen Roffler, published in Ecology, and documenting this R package MV Tweedy that is a, a simpler approach to stomach contents. So um, you know, food habits generally is studied with stomach contents, you know, necropsy on deck capture and sorting, you know, behavioral observation like bill loads. Um, you know, I guess like the Scott Hack, you know, I, as I understand it, like we'll make like a little fence outside of the uh, the nest of a bird and see what it drops when it's confused why there's a fence. Um, you know, there's biogeochemistry like stable isotopes or fatty acids. Um, and so there's a hog, you know, this growing hodgepodge of methods to be uh, combined. And each of those has a, you know, different, you know, multiple sampling methods, you know, visual, genetic, um, stomach temperature loggers. And so all of these, you know, beg for kind of a, a statistical framework that can combine multiple data types. And um, in terms of, you know, decades of methods to analyze food habits, you know, there is a, um, an average uh, percent frequency and current of occurrence or biomass proportions, um, which has a downside of giving you bias if your sampling is spatially imbalanced, which I think almost all food habit sampling is spatially imbalanced. There's, um, you know, the Alaska Center does a lot of post stratification of sampling and then hierarchical expansion using predator densities. This um, is mitigates broad scale spatial bias, but it ignores fine scale heterogeneity and it is not easy to bring in continuous predictors like size or age, which might be post stratified as bins again, and then ignoring heterogeneity within those size and age bins. There's sort of a class of Dirichlet mixture models that um, allow a mix of stratified and continuous predictors, but um, you know, might seem intimidating. They require modifying data a priori to eliminate zeros and ones, and um, and the predictors are are hard to hard to interpret. And so um, I'll be introducing what's a, a Tweedy generalized additive model that allows mixed predictors, does not require preprocessing data, and basically is fitted as a, a GAM or GLIM, which I I hope is familiar to many people. So. Um, you know, besides being a gamma or glim, it has sort of a, a, a you know, a deep theory as a what's called a thinned and marked point process. So a point process is 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 a model where individual locations S for every prey I is treated as a random variable. Um, a Poisson point process assumes that counts over an area are Poisson distributed. A marked point process assumes each individual has additional marks like the prey and their size. And then a thin point process assumes that we only see some of the points. Um, and so you can think of um, foraging across a landscape as this thin and marked point process where prey are distributed across a landscape and have you know, a, a label for their prey taxa as well as their size. So if they're, you know, I'll kind of play this out with three prey species that are distributed in home ranges. Um, shown in the left middle and right column here and color coded and the size of each dot is proportional to their biomass and then overlaid on that is three different central place forager ranges in red green and purple um you know so like for instance the purple range is largest and is catching some of prey one but prey two and three are not don't appear to have any dots in that home range for site c so if we look at um, 
a single realization that those sites, those are in um, vertical lines in this second row, or we can look, we can simulate from this distribution thousands of times to get a distribution for those sites of what we'd expect to see at those sites, where the circles are the proportion of zeros. Um, and so for instance, at site C, at site C, <coughs> Prey 2 is expected to ha have zero encounters nearly 85 or 90 percent of the time, and that's shown in that circ that square in site C on the right-hand second row. Um, we can then approximate that distribution as a Tweedy distribution, and we get a approximate approximation of that true sampling distribution shown as continuous lines with circles at zero. And so that the second row and the third row should look similar, that's my claim. And then we can even fit that distribution as a glim by placing additional restrictions on parameters. And here there's sort of from the third row to the fourth row, there's some some differences in that distribution that's imposed by restricting parameters. So you can fit it as a glim or gam. But the um the proportions listed in the third and fourth row are are the same. And so you can still get a good prediction even if the, the distribution is slightly off in this approximation. So, you know, why would we care about this thinned marked point process? Well, we can fit it using, we can calculate proportions using this multivariate logit transformation of the output. And we can do that all using standard software in R, like the MGCV package and the ggplot to visualize results. So <laughs> the first one we did, first example was, um, using data you know generously provided by Scott Hatch for Middleton Island that's part of the R package that um, that, that we built here to load the data we load a, a data from the package we then run a GAM where it's basically a spline on year by group and where group is the prey species we can then predict the response using a predict call like an s3 class in R and then just use ggplot to visualize the output. And so this is going to make a time series plot of the three, the seven different prey for these tufted puffins in Middleton Island. And if we do that, you know, plot it with ggplot and, and we bring in a sea surface temperature covariate, which is a few extra lines. It's not that much harder. We can see that um, in the 80s through the 2000s, there was this sort of alternation between Pacific sand lance and prowfish as dominant prey. And then in the 2000s through 2020, there's sort of an alternation between Pacific herring and capelin, where um, you know people have commented that herring typically had a higher proportion in warm years, shown as yellow in these plots, whereas capelin was more prominent in cold years. And if we fit that um, temperature response for each prey, we actually see that herring has a significantly positive effect for temperature um, and, and, and interaction for temperature. So the model um, identifies this sort of significant effect where in the last 20 years, the alternation between capelin and herring is attributed to um, annual temperatures in the Gulf, well, near Middleton Island. We also did the same thing for wolves, showing spatial variation. This is a data set um, that Gretchen Roffler and Tal Levy have been collecting. Um, <coughs> and it involves, you know, obtaining samples of uh, wolf scat in southeast Alaska and then applying DNA metabar coding to you know get um, a count of primers you know of, of, of uh, snip, snips of DNA associated with each prey for 10 major prey taxa. It's a slightly more extended GG plot in particular to make plots of maps but um, the GAM that's fitted here is is just a smoother on latitude and longitude and then the same thing by prey group. And so if we um, look at the ggplot output for that, we see that black-tailed deer and mountain goats are pretty high everywhere. I mean, it's graying out some of these islands that don't have wolves, but the areas with wolves, um, deer and mountain goat are pretty prevalent everywhere. Um, however, there's sort of upland areas that where fish is a big part of the diet. There's seaward islands where marine mammals are a big part of the wolf diet. And then, you know, so on and so forth, like um, beavers in the south. Um, you know, so you get this sort of landscape um, of predation, um, 
you know, which kind of, you know, for a mobile predator is, is fascinating, I think, when you start thinking about, you know, interannual variation and the abundance of these different prey species. So um, the point here is that we can fit food habits with something as simple as a GAM using this MV Tweedy class. Um, and the R package here is, is public. Um, you can put in covariates affecting log density, um, you know, and you can think about them as catchability or density covariates. And so I'm really hoping this um, allows, you know, a wider range of, of ecologists to, you know, jump into the, you know, you know, everybody on the call could download data for halibut and start exploring their um, prey switching, their spatial patterns and, and interannual variation in um, diet. So thanks to my co-authors as well as these other people for discussions, um, in particular Brandon Chasco who contributed a lot. Um, <coughs> so the next step, which we actually did earlier sequentially was a paper led by Arno Gruss and published in this Fish and Fisheries in 2020, where we did a similar model using VAST, which is this multivariate spatial temporal R package that I maintain. Um, it, you know, takes that, you know, it's it's a more complicated software, so some people don't want to learn VAST, although I think it's um, quite flexible and, and worth considering. Um, and and the, the point of VAST is that we can fit both stomach contents and predator densities and then expand stomach contents, you know, based on predator densities at each location and sum across space to get an actually, uh, you know, a good estimate of total consumptive removals from a given predator. So in this case, consumption, predator expanded stomach contents is proportional to product of prey biomass per predator biomass, like from a stomach content sample. And then the product of that with predator biomass, you know, we might have a sampling program like bottom trawls that gives, hal uh, this is a bad example because I don't know the details, but let's say halibut bottom trawl data is the best sample of halibut consumption, but then hook and line data is the best sample of predator, you know, halibut densities. You can work up each of those data sets um, in a joint model using different survey data that are not collected at the same time or place. Um, but you have a model that, you know, still allows you to fit both and then take their product and get total consumptive removals. <coughs> so we have two case studies of this. The first one is this data rich example of Eastern Bering Sea Pollock using the kind of large size class from 1992 to 2015 and looking across um, major prey forage um, in the Eastern Bering Sea. So if we do this and we, we um, expand, you know, this is fitting bottom trawl data and then bottom trawl captures that are sorted for stomach contents. We fit that model, we take the product of predator density and prey proportions, sum that across space to get these diet proportions and a confidence interval. We see that, you know, euphausids are a big proportion of Pollock diet, but there are years where, you know, fish are a larger proportion, getting up to 50%. Um, <coughs> you know, and then there's individual years like some of the um, some of the um, initial like uh, cold years in 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 20, uh, 2010, um, where amphipods were a bigger proportion. Um, so you get this prey switching. You can also get a total um, predator uh, expanded stomach contents summing across prey species. To get a, a index of prey, you know, stomach fullness, and so um, if we do this, we estimate that stomach fullness was highest in the early '90s and has since then kind of hovered at a relatively lower level. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have, a, I have a cold, so um, please excuse my coughing on, on, on the, in the microphone. And then we get these. Um, we can take the average across time of these. Um, consumptive removal. So this is the product of um, predator expanded, it's predator expanded stomach contents, the product of prey proportions and predator biomass. And so, you know, fish has the highest consumptive removals in this kind of northern outer domain, um, shrimps there, but also throughout the, um, you know, 
middle and into Bristol Bay and New Fousins, the highest in the south. Um, and then <laughs> we can look at those and contrast individual years. Um, yeah, so look, you know, looking at warm years here, um, you know, there's some there's some contrast. Let's see, so the the warm year of 2013, 2003 versus a a colder year in 2015, I think is the point. Um, you know, you know, looking at contrasting um, landscape of predation for for this major predator. Um, and then we we also did a case study in a more data limited situation using um, Western Florida shelf red grouper. This is a data set collected, by, well, that I'm aware of originally from Cam Ainsworth. I actually think it's from CMAP groundfish bottom trawl data, and it's it's four years with fewer samples. They um, they use these data to parameterize an Osmos and also I think an Atlantis model for the Western Florida shelf. And um, you know, we use data for um, older juvenile red grouper. We get these diet proportions on the right-hand side where crabs were lower than other prey in 2012, but high, higher in other years. There's fewer samplers samples. <coughs> so unsurprisingly, the interval width shown in these dashed lines is wider than in the Pollock example. Um, you know, again, the... Um, the biomass for red grouper over this time has declined, but the um, the predator expanded stomach content, the stomach fullness index has been pretty stable over time. And then looking at the, the consumptive removals, all of these again as the product of prey, um, prey per predator and the predator biomass. And so they all are clustered towards areas with the highest biomass of red grouper. But there are again spatial differences in terms of you know crabs, um, crab consumptive removals being further south skewed than shrimp, um, for instance. So um, you get this landscape of consumptive removals. We can use that to parameterize a diet matrix, you know, by summing over space, or we can use it, um, you know, spatial estimates of that to um, to feed in for local prey switching in Osmos or other models that can use that. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, Arno and, and colleagues have thought a lot about whether we should do, you know, spatial management of spotting grounds. Um, you know, similarly, you can en envision a case where there's sort of an interest in protecting or identifying um, individual areas where they're consuming uh, you know, most important prey taxa. <laughs> so um, those were the two pieces on stomach contents. And I I wonder, um, Ian, if you saw any questions that might be worth bringing up now, or I could shift gears and move into the movement piece. I don't see any questions yet. So why don't you go ahead and continue on and we'll pile them up as we go. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so so those are, um, you know, two of the examples we've worked on for these, um, I'm sorry, I've, I, uh, I've never, I, I recorded a talk in, um, for NPRB, I think, and now it forces my slides forward, I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> um, but um, shifting gears, you know, I'll next try to talk about what I think is a, a similarly simplified way of thinking about movement, and it spans both um, Lagrangian, you know, so like individual animal track reconstruction, like we do for archival tags or GPS tags and protected species, but it can also be applied to Eulerian models, you know, these sort of box models, um, <clears throat> and so it's a generic framework across that divide in movement ecology, um, and you know, colleagues and I, including Steve Barbeau, Dan Gothel, Kelly Kearney, Ned Lehman, um, Kevin Swicky and Grant Thompson, all at the Alaska Center, and then Matt Siski's a postdoc with me, a talented postdoc, and, and Julie Nielsen's a contractor. Um, we, you, you know, wanted to demonstrate the flexibility and power of this approach by applying it to a combination of survey, fishery, CPUE, and tagging data for Pacific Cod. And the paper was published in Fish and Fisheries, I think, in 2020. 
um, for those who want to see more, and um, both Kevin Swicky and Matt Siski also are um, exploring different uh, follow-up directions for this class of model. So in terms of um, the variety of information we have about movement, you know, there's been decades of conventional or floy tags de deployed. It's a low unit cost, but incredibly low return rates. And so there's only the, the kind of biggest fisheries that ever had conventional tagging programs. Um, there's survey data, you know, which is a snapshot of the realized distribution, and it could reveal the net effect of movement and other population processes like spatial mortality. <laughs> Fishery data similarly realizes the outcome of movement of these other processes, along with a set of, you know, but you have to make a set of assumptions about catchability. There's archival tags that provide high resolution information about environmental conditions and can be used to reconstruct tracks. There's these, you know, fascinating growth and movement gates, you know, so freshwater fish, we always had weirs, but now we've got um, upward facing acoustics where we can have an array of these to detect movement of fish, you know, for instance, across the Russian border. There's, um, hap, you know, habitat selection experiments, you know, so, um, you know, exposing fish to different alternatives in the lab and seeing how often they choose one or the other which is, you know, tremendous process research, but hard to scale up. There's a set of biogeochemical and parasite markers um, that can identify sort of short-term or, you know, lifespan habitat utilization. And then there's the occurrence or density of prey and predator food habit samples, as we talked about. So all of these things are sort of different vantages to think about movement. And again, we I think we want a framework that we can assimilate all of these data. So the um, the very quick tour of this is that we're doing what's called a um, continuous time Markov chain model, and it defines a instantaneous movement rate matrix M that it represents the rate of movement from any one of let's say 100 grid cells to every other cell. And because it's an instantaneous rate, you know, fish can't teleport. Um, and so they only ever move to adjacent cells and that instant that instantaneous movement rate matrix is sparse. It has a bunch of zeros for non-adjacent cells. And we, we further decompose that instantaneous movement rate matrix into a, a matrix that's diffusion, the kind of random and unexplained movement away from where you are towards neighboring cells. Um, a taxis matrix that's the movement towards preferred habitat, and then a passive advection matrix V. You know, so you could take um, tidal currents or dominant ocean currents. We were talking, you know, Ian and I were talking about Hake. Um, you know, you could take a, a vector field of the um, California current and you know specify kind of hard code that they move upstream in that current and then estimate a rate. Um, and so that would be a way to bring in kind of ocean physics like eddies and streamers into your movement model. Um, and then basically you've got an instantaneous rate and there's an operator called the matrix exponential that integrates that across a delta T. Um, M prime, this instantaneous rate is a, is a sparse matrix the integrated movement is dense. You know, there's a non-zero for every set of cells because, you know, over even just a day, you know, maybe a fish does a sprint and it gets not just to an adjacent cell, but further than that. Um, and then that that integrated movement matrix M is an operator you can apply to a vector of abundance <clears throat> across all these grid cells to project it forward one time step to get your projected abundance the next time. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip some of the properties of that, but i um, happy to come back to the math of it. So um, the key here and the, new, the newest and exciting piece for me is that we can define the taxis matrix, um, this Z matrix, we can define with a habitat preference function H. So um, let's say we've got a set of covariates for every location G, every grid cell G. Um, 
you know, for Pacific Cod, maybe we've got one for bathymetry and bottom temperature, but we've also got one for U thousand density from a ROMS model and sea ice extent from satellites and even one constructed from their distance from a spawning ground like Matt Siski has been um, cleverly exploring, we can have all of those covariates in a design matrix X, and then we estimate a vector of coefficients alpha, and that's how we construct this preference function H. And then taxis is just moving from a less preferred towards a more preferred habitat. So that's, you know, in it, and they can't move to non-adjacent habitat. So that's this, this equation on the bottom where you just take the difference of the preference from two adjacent grid cells to get their taxis rate. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, thinking that through in a, in a one dimensional example, here we have, um, a, a, a toy model with 25 grid cells, NG equals 25 distributed on the X axis. And in the top left, we've got two environmental layers. We've got depth. So it gets deeper as they go from west to east. And then there's a bottom temperature where it's highest on the west and the east border. Um, if you just plug in some habitat preference parameters where they prefer higher temperatures and deeper depths, you get in the top left a preference function that is shown in black where they prefer to move away from the middle. They'd rather go east, but some of them will go west. So that's their habitat preference function. Um, there's a diffusion rate that you, in this case, I specify that generates a diffusion away from where they are. So, you know, the diagonal is negative and the off diagonal is positive. The taxis matrix is also sparse, it's zero in the off diagonal. Well, it's tridiagonal, zero everywhere off the non adjacent cells. Um, and it's basically saying, like, if you're in the, um, if you're west of the bottom uh, lowest preference, then you would tend to want to move further west or up, like red is above the diagonal from for values less than three on the x-axis, and it's below the diagonal for higher values where they want to move east. So um, if you release an individual at in the west, in the bottom, well, in the bottom row, it's showing what happens if you release an individual at different locations. So the left hand on the bottom is releasing one in the west, um, the middle in the bottom is releasing the middle, and then the F panel on the right is releasing them in the east side. Um, where you release them is shown in this gray bar. After one time step, they get to a distribution uh, shown in red, then purple, then blue, and then asymptotically they converge on a limiting distribution or their stationary distribution um, as T goes to infinity, which is black. Regardless of where you start them, they all converge on the same black line. And that black line looks a little bit like the black line in the pref environmental preference function. Um, but because they because of diffusion, if they get stuck in the west, they still tend to walk back to the east. So that's um, diffusion and habitat preference sort of combine to generate their, their um, habitat utilization. Um, and so the point is you can, you can predict given where they started at any time interval where they would be and basically if you invert that you get the likelihood that you can use to estimate parameters so we're going to put that in um, the simplest possible population model so one that ignores any um, production function and just says that every time interval total abundance goes up or down there's this kind of slop that's the delta term, and then they are redistributed using this movement operator, and there's additional process errors um, where the variance is different at the initial versus subsequent time intervals. Um, and then, you know, so this is basically a state space, a multivariate state space model with a movement operator. And we, we fit it with survey data that follows a Tweedy distribution, fishery data that follows gamma because the, the survey has zeros, whereas the fishery in this case does not have zeros the way we process and identify targeting. Um, there's also a catchability ratio of the fishery relative to the survey that I won't really get into um, in an area swept term and, and yada yada. There's some kind of additional parameters related to, to fitting these. And we're gonna fit conventional tags by basically taking where they started out and taking the time elapsed. So it's conditioning on recapture. It's kind of like a Cormac Jolly Siever model 
for movement. Um, and and the product of that is their movement times their um, times this effort, the fishery effort for that represents recapture probability. Um, we also speculate about how to use movement gates, like this upward facing acoustics on the Russian border. Um, although I, well, I'll skip it for now. So um, if we if we fit this model to you know 35, 40 years of data in the eastern and northern Bering Sea from Pacific Cod, we're dividing it into two seasons, a summer and a winter season. So there's like 70 or 80 time intervals. Um, and we're fitting it in this example, just using bathymetry and summer and winter bottom temperature, um, using a combination of survey, fishery, and conventional tagging data. Um, the the covariate rasters look like this, where there's an EFH layer compiled by Zimmerman for essential fish habitat use. And then there's a summer temperature um, and a winter temperature um, for every year extracted from the Bering 10K ROMS model, um, where you know obviously the winter has a larger spatial extent for cold waters near the bottom. <coughs> um, and if we fit that model, those those covariates um, to the data, kind of glossing over some of the details and, and you know, fitting in TMB, um, and then we visualize the 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 response curves using the effects package in R to get intervals. We get this habitat preference function on the left hand side for temperature, and then the bathymetry preference function on the right hand side. I'm specifying a formula where the bathymetry is. I'm just kind of making up. Uh, the ecology of their preference function. So in this case, I'm assuming their temperature is the same between winter. So temperature preference is the same between winter and summer, whereas their bathymetry preference might vary between spawning and feeding seasons. Um, and the preference function is lower. You know, it drops off as you get below zero degrees Celsius. So they prefer to move away from really cold temperatures or estimated to. Um, it kind of plateaus from zero to four, and then it seems to think that it might increase a little bit even past four, although the intervals are pretty wide. Um, in terms of the bathymetry, estimated bathymetry preference, you know, it's slightly more broad, um, I would say, in the in the winter than the summer, but there's not a whole strong bathymetric preference except that they avoid, you know, deeper than 600 meters in both seasons. We can take the fitted model and do these little numerical experiments about what would happen if we release an individual at the red dot at the beginning of a cold stanza versus a warm stanza. And, um, you know, and then kind of play it forward like a movie across five years. And, you know, basically this is my plot saying that the model is not doing that much, you know, it's not estimating that big of a difference between cold and warm stances, you know, I don't think it's doing what we think ecologically is happening because it's basically a, a little toy demo and we didn't spend a lot of time identifying ecologically meaningful covariates. Um, there is a little bit of difference. The white spaces are areas with a low um, probability of being in a place after a certain time. And especially after five years, you can see a little bit of difference on the left column versus the right in the bottom row, but it's pretty subtle. Um, so, you know, this, you know, this, this tuned model, you know, fitted model is not, um, the, the final story for COD by any means. We can also visualize the, um, estimated preference in the summer and the winter in the left-hand columns or the predicted log density in the, um, third and fourth columns across these different years, um, looking at preference you know in the summer they seem to have a higher preference in these kind of near shore areas whereas in winter they tend to have higher preference further offshore kind of towards the outer domain where you know the pre high preference is shown in yellow so it captures a bit of seasonal difference in um you know going towards shallow waters in summer and then the log densities you know capture this sort of uh what we believe has happened where they've increased in density in the northern Bering Sea in 2017 and 18 relative to um, 2002 or 2012. We can visualize these like Dharma residuals, these probability integral pr transform predictive residuals. And um, they, let's see, these, these old p-values don't actually mean much shown on the right-hand side. 
there's work to improve how we do residuals in these types of models, but um, there's not a huge pattern, a spatial pattern of over unpredicting conventional tags. Um, the recovery locations in the top left on the left hand side. Um, and then we can define different uh, move, movement fractions from the model. So we can we can coarsen the model. You know, if you have a, a spatially high resolution model, you can always coarsen it, where it's whereas it's hard to go the other direction. And so in this take, we take in this in this case, we take a high resolution model and coarsen it, and look at movement fractions that are moving from the NBS to EBS or the EBS to NBS. And basically, the model predicts that there. The probability of moving from the EBS in blue, moving from the EBS to NBS has always been low, but but it used to be that any individual that moved to the NBS would move back really quickly. And over time that probability has dropped. And so um, that in different ways of calculating the proportion in the NBS, regardless of the way you do it, you know, the model predicts that there will be fish building up in the Northern Bering Sea over time. And that's consistent what, what 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 we think is happening with Pacific Cod. We can do these sensitivities to different data sets. So if we exclude fishery data, we get a story that's very similar to what we just showed. If we exclude survey data, we get a wildly wrong picture of their proportion in the EBS versus NBS, but their movement rate is similar. So basically the survey data is necessary to tell the model where fish are. And then if we kick out the tagging data, we get a picture of their habitat utilization that's about what we think, but their movement is way too low, their movement rate. They don't, the model doesn't really predict them to move much. Um, and so, you you know, basically the sensitivity shows that we need the tagging data to get movement rates right, and we need the survey data to get a correct picture of where, where the fish are. And then finally, we tried to play this through to take that movement fraction and put it as an, in as an index, a time series index into a two box stock synthesis model that Grant Thompson had built, I think in 20, the 2018 assessment cycle. Uh, and it didn't, you know, basically the, the gray line on the right is the estimated proportion of the EBS from this model that Grant put together. And um, the circles, these bullets, are the estimated proportion in the Eastern Bering Sea from survey data. Um, and you know, the model he put together was thinking that, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the fish were in the Northern Bering Sea even back in time, which is wildly inconsistent with what, with our survey data. So the gray line didn't it didn't seem like a suit suitable model stock assessment. The blue line is what we get if we plug in our movement fractions, and it's um, also not a very suitable model because it only predicts that about 10% are in the north by 2017, whereas survey data suggests it was almost 50%. So um, again, this is my way of saying that like we could take output from this model and plug it in as an index of movement, but it depends on the model performing well, the movement model, and in this case, we, um, you know, either the lack of covariates, meaning, ecologically meaningful covariates, or the lack of the archival tags that we've collected but are not yet able to reuse this way. Um, you know, those would be necessary to build a, a better model of movement for Pacific Cod. But um, regardless of the somewhat unsatisfying performance when plugged into an assessment model for Pacific Cod, um, I hope that it does convince you that this class of models called a continuous continuous time Markov chain is able to fit a, a whole bunch of different types of data um, and estimate, you know, movement, you know, habitat preference and diffusion parameters that are, you know, ecologically meaningful and could be very useful if we were able to invest the time to get to, you know, get this model tuned up. Um, you know, so for instance, it could <laughs> fit conventional tags survey, passive acoustics, predators as samplers, biogeochemistry, and these upward facing upward facing acoustics. Um, and the demo for this again is on GitHub as this package ATM, um, if anyone's interested. So um, I think this is my last slide, but um, you know we can we can get the synthetic picture of movement 
Um, you know, in terms of other mechanisms that we're exploring, you know, we, we for a couple of years, we're deploying sail drones as, um, you know, to run these transects as acoustic receivers. Um, you know, it'd be amazing if we, you know, live in a world where it's cheap enough to do that and deploy a bunch of acoustic tags that we can, you know, a multi-species acoustic tag program using sail drones to detect fine scale movement. There's also increased, um, you know, parentage markers or stock structure markers from genetics. Um, and then there's a lot of chemical tracers that continue to be developed, including oxygen isotope and trace element. So um, with that, I'll put up this long list of people who contributed to thinking about this work. And I think that's it for my talk. So um, I should say too, yeah, thanks again to Ian um, for the invitation and thank you for your time. Thanks for a great presentation, Jim. Um, for those of you that signed on late, if you missed it, you can type questions into the chat box and uh, we'll, I'll pass those on to Jim. While we're waiting for uh, questions to come in, Jim, I have one. We have what's kind of, I think, a bit of a unique data set in that in 2012, we did an extensive bait study across our entire survey design. And so I I'm thinking of that study sort of like diet data turned on its head. We have a direct measure of preference of different food types and I'm wondering whether you think that kind of data set would be amenable to similar modeling that you were presenting earlier and looking at covariates like temperature and relative size at age, density, bioenergetics, other things. Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I, uh, you know, my brain is like programmed to follow the track that I, I think you were doing with Cole, you know, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but like the, um, study you guys did about, um, you know, kind of integrating different types of um, hook placement, and um, you know, presumably, if you've got information about the prey that was put on each hook, it would also be another covariate that could go into the way you um, analyze those data. Do you do you use that prey um, preference for different prey in the way you work up those data currently? Well, we used it to determine that we really didn't want to change the bait we used on our survey. Uh, because we well, found good. Yeah. we found some pretty interesting different spatial differences in the preference for different baits interesting. and i think it's it, it i've never really thought about that data set as a, a reflector of the underlying biology that was going on but I, I think it might be a quite an interesting data set to work with yeah that's weird yeah i i mean i always wonder you know like if they you know certainly in other animals you know there's the thought that they'll become less selective as they as their individual, um, you know, energy reserves get depleted, um, and I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, like you, if you've got kind of, you know, morphometric or, um, you know, higher quality like condition measures of those fish, you know, to compare that with their prey selection spatially, that'd be a super interesting story. Yeah, we would have size at age for all of those fish, as well as um, temperature, bottom temperature associated with each of the survey stations, density estimates from the survey, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of soured a little bit on morphometric condition, like the weight length relationship, because I think on the bottom trawl, a lot of our um, weights are, you know, without the stomach removed. And, um, you know, for something like a gadded, I mean, I think the stomach could be I'm I'm scared to say a number. I think I think maybe 20% of the body size. I'm sure somebody knows a better estimate. You know, and so that's a huge portion of variability that's, you know, that looks like morphometric condition that's actually stomach fullness. Um if I hear if I heard you right earlier, I guess when they get on the hook, they vomit anyway. So maybe that's a better case for um thinking that that morphometric condition would would you know it, it seems like a better use for it i'm saying i mean add that to our long list of things to follow up on ian exactly uh I, i'm not seeing much coming in in the way of questions i don't know if people are having trouble typing into the box or if they're all still just taking notes from uh the equations yeah. you presented yeah well no worries i mean i i uh 
you know, it's I'm I'm grateful to have the I mean I'll you know I'm just kind of stalling here to see if anybody jumps in, but um I appreciate you guys having the venue even during COVID and um you know people are free. I should have put out my email I guess somewhere here, but um you know it's james.thorson at noah.gov and I'd be happy to walk through both of these kind of sets of methods, you know, or collaborate on them. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. And, and just to remind people that we will this this presentation was recorded and it will be posted, probably reflected somewhere in on Jim's uh, social media as well. <laughs> well, I don't have social media, but I do have I do have the YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be somewhere online. Excellent. Well, Jim, I'm going to thank you for uh, presenting to us today and remind everybody we have another seminar coming up on the 25th of May and then a follow-up again. I think the next one after that's in June. So we look forward to um, hearing from people. Sorry, yeah. I, now I'm seeing a question coming in, but having trouble accessing it. Let's see if I can read it here. Can you see that? I actually can't. Okay, here you go. It says, uh, great work. I really appreciate your talk. How does a lack of an area surveyed affect movement estimates? Does that assume the fish are not there? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, so like for instance, I mean, if I'm hearing this right, like what happens in the model when we don't have survey data in the Northern Bering Sea? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I've been sort of advocating that you know, like we've spent, we've spent a bunch of money on these archival tags that results in these reconstructed tracks for individual animals and they they tell us a ton for pacific cod like they've told the story of the western goa being connected potentially with the bering sea stock and that would be a huge step forward in understanding if it if it's borne out across years but you know it's hard to move from individual level inference to population level inference without either a design for releasing the archival tags or a model that gives you inference to unsampled individuals and so um you know, this preference function is assumed to be the same across space. You know, the habitat is different, but the actual preference is assumed to be the same unless you put an interaction with it on region or whatever. Um, and so it's it's able to predict what would have happened to animals even in areas where you don't have sampling. And then similarly, the, um, you know, this, this sort of, um, you know, we do these sort of spatial temporal models to try to deal with index standardization given missing data in the Northern Bering Sea. And that we do that because it has this autoregressive process that propagates hotspots across sort of unsampled times and it gives you the variance associated with not sampling there and yada yada. Um, the, the process errors in this model are a random walk and so it has the same kind of property of kind of filling in, you know, the density of fish in the Northern Bering Sea, even in unsampled years. So so that's that's sort of the two ways this ATM package is trying to deal with kind of missing, you know, areas that are missing data. Um, but, you know, with any model-based inference, you know, there there will be assumptions where it would fail. And, you know, we, I think, have some understanding of you know the robustness of kind of simple spatial temporal models you know matt's postdoc is is all about doing simulation testing for this atm package and i hope to know more soon about how robust it is to different kind of bias sampling scenarios i but should have mentioned i should have mentioned that that pre that question was from alan hicks okay yeah well, thanks. I, I guess I have a, a follow-up, which is that in, in light of the more recent tagging data, uh, I'm wondering, do you, do you guys have plans to extend that cod analysis to in, actually include the Western Gulf and allow those fish in the wintertime to go all the way back to where they really live? Yeah, no, that's fascinating. I, I um, you know, we um, basically, like, I've been waiting for the archival tagging team to kind of get their first bite at the apple before um trying to incorporate any of the archival tags and you know we we started deploying archival tags i i maybe 2018 i don't i don't know so the the more recent ones are the ones showing the western goa i would be delighted to have the ones for the release to the nbs <coughs> because i think those would firm up 
some of the preference parameters pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I kind of hoped I'd have those ready for Matt, and it and it and I just haven't had access to them yet. But um, you know, Halibut. If there's archival tags for Halibut, you know, they would be, you know, it'd be fun to kind of boot up other projects along these lines too. Yeah, we do have um, a, a wide range of tagging information for Halibut, including our pit tagging study, which was very cool. extensive. Uh, Alan says thanks uh, for answering his question. He's excited to learn more. We also have a question from uh, Thomas Marking online who asks, how does the model react with Apache distribution like 2A? And just for, for your information, so how the distribution in um, 2A is the West Coast tends to be much more patchy at the southern end of its range than it is across, uh, especially in the core where they're distributed virtually everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> there you know i've been trying you know working to develop some of these methods and i really want you know i'd feel more comfortable answering some of these questions with more independent testing you know that vast is open source and i encourage you know has a simulator but i encourage people to kind of road test it in different ways you know and i'll feel more comfortable making strong claims when when other people have corroborated these things more um you know, in the Gulf of Alaska, in the Aleutian Islands, you know, some of the models end up being more different between the model and the design-based estimate. And, um, you know, I, I think that's because of the Pakshi habitat, you know, relatively Pakshi habitat in the Goa and the, and the Aleutian Islands relative to the Bering Sea. Um, you know, basically we're still, you know, I think we've done simulation testing suggesting that the model-based you know, performs better on average and, um, you know, but but we still want these stories. We want to be able to interpret why it gives a different answer. <coughs> and that's that sort of attributing differences between the design based and the model based is sort of a growth topic. Um, and it, like like you're asking, I think it will ultimately have a lot to do with sort of the patchiness and how much that patchiness varies across space and, and so forth. I know y'all have been using model-based estimators too for the indices and I um, I wonder if if you know if anybody on the call can has the perspective for Halibut on that. Yeah thanks Jim I'm not sure we can patch uh, everybody in to answer sure. those questions, but yeah, like you say, where there's actually we've had a lot of convergence in some of the models that you've developed with what we've what we've been doing here. Although we have yet to integrate the tagging data into the distribution or the the um, density model. So I'm seeing that it's uh, 12 o'clock and no other questions come in. So thanks a lot for taking time for us today, Jim, and um, look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah, have a good day. Thanks everyone for coming.